Hi guys. Um, I have to start with a confession. Uh, I'm not a craftsperson. I'm a designer. And uh, for years, I didn't really get the difference between craftspeople and designers. I just thought the craftspeople were a very particular type of designer that had a tendency to focus on the handmade. And I mean, after all, it's kind of the same process for all kinds of makers. You know, you have an idea, you go through a process, you have an object as an output. And um, I have a big interest in digital fabrication, so I'm talking to you today. And for a while now, I've had Cross people kind of balk at digital fabrication whenever I talk about it. Now, I think I might be preaching to the choir a little bit with you all here today, because you've come to a symposium on digital fabrication. But um, I didn't really understand why they were like so horrified. When I would talk about like uh, making things with machines to cross people, they would get this look of creeping horror and sort of back away a little bit. And I was confused. I just thought, you know, it's another tool like anything else. So, you know, what did it? And I was thinking about it. And I came across this quote in this book, which says, craftsmanship means simply workmanship using any kind of technique or apparatus in which the quality of the result is not predetermined, but depends on the judgment, dexterity, and care which the maker exercises as he works. The essential idea is that the quality of the result is continually at risk during the process of making. I thought that was a really nice summary of the difference between craftspeople and designers the penny sort of dropped for me a little bit. Because a pure designer doesn't really care about the process by which something's made. They want a good output, and they want their concept to be realized, but the process is a bit lower in the mix. So a designer, a pure designer would be like, um, you know, a composer who doesn't care if a robot plays their music as long as it's right. Well, a craftsperson is more like um, a concert pianist. You know, the music is dependent on their continued skill. Now, if we want to argue about the like, philosophy of, um, of craft afterwards, please do. Like I said, I'm not a crafts person, I'm just interested. So, for crafts people, I think the, the process is higher in the mix. It's more important to the, to the act of making. And although I'm a designer, I'm a very makey designer. I like making things. And I've had things manufactured and there's a sort of a thrill to that when you have, you know, you send off drawings and then this fully formed object comes back and it's great. It's kind of, it's kind of a thrill. But also I understand the, the satisfaction you get from something coming together in your hands, you know, when every choice and action you make has been the correct one to have a good output. And the reason I'm going on this sort of meandering anecdote is because I've had things manufactured. I make things. And digital fabrication to me feels more like craft than manufacture. And it's an important difference. When I was in college, um, we, we didn't have access to CNC equipment or digital fabrication, but we did have this machine which I thought was really neat, which is a pantograph mill. I can't find a video of the actual mill, but this is a little demonstration of how it works. So over here at, I have a couple there. Over here at E, you would set up like a jig or you would freehand a tracing tool and then the machine would translate it and cut it out of the material here at F. And I think this is interesting because it's like the most basic version of how all this digital fabrication stuff works. People think that um, it's, it's sort of things being made out of the ether, but it's just a mechanical translation of your work from one medium to another. So in exactly the same way with this mill, if you don't have that big triangle at E, you're getting nothing out of F. So with digital fabrication, what it is, is instead of it being a mechanical translation, you're taking a file and running it through a computer and then a machine is cutting it. So the difference is rather than having a physical object or a drawing that you're doing, you use a particular type of file for most cutting things like laser cutting or CNC cutting called a vector. Now, this is going to be a little bit technical and you can like tune out a little bit if you want. You don't actually need to know this, but I think it's kind of helpful. So there's two types of, um, of image file you'll come across. So one is a bitmap. So that's like JPEGs or any photo files or things you usually use on a computer. And uh, sorry to you especially, you've already heard this. And the other is um, a, a vector. Um, so the difference is if we zoom in on both of them, you'd see that the bitmap is all jagged and pixelated around the edge, while a vector always stays smooth. It's because the computer deals with these different types of files in very different ways. 
So a bitmap works like this. It has a grid and it says, okay, the first score is going to be white, second one's going to be white, third one's going to be gray, dark gray, whatever, and so on and so forth, till it has the full shape made. But how a vector works is it figures out where the center of your circle needs to be, and then it works out what diameter it needs to be, and it draws a line around the outside and tells the computer to fill it in black. And that's why they're always crisp and always sharp, because they're being mathematically programmed rather than being like, it's like having a compass and a pencil rather than cross-stitching something. This outline that the vector uses to make its shapes is called a path. And the best way to think of a path is if you were moving your hand to draw something, the shape that your hand traces is like the path. You can put a bunch of different tools in your hand and come out with very different marks, but the path that you're following is always the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So it could be just mark making, but equally if I dropped the pen and picked up a scalpel, then I could cut a shape out. And it's those paths that these machines work off of. And you might have actually used some programs that make these. If any of you have ever used Autodesk or AutoCAD or um, Illustrator, you will have been working with vectors and making the sort of paths that these machines run off of, whether you knew it at the time or not. So I just want to show you really quickly, it's actually really, really easy to work this stuff. So this is a drawing I made of an extremely hairy boyfriend of mine. Um, it was just, it's, there's nothing complicated here, it was just on Sharpie on, on A4 paper. And I, er, I scanned it into the computer. So, so I've dropped it into Illustrator, and if I click on it and hit image trace, just go like this. Let me just wait a second. And then this. Now we have a file that the, the laser cutter will be able to do. And it's just that quick. You don't really need to have a high level of competence with these programs before you can start producing things. So in true Blue Peter fashion, here's one we made earlier. So you see that round. For anyone who's still waiting on it, there's, um, there's a picture of it here. Sorry, I know it kind of looks like it was taken on a potato, but you can see how quick that this is done. So the, the thing that's being passed around now, we cut on the laser cutter here this morning, and it took about, about 10 minutes. I think because it's quite a complicated cut. Sorry, Sorry that's almost a question. So this hand drawing but machine cutting thing is used quite often. And you'll often see things like uh, paper cuts or things that have that hand drawn quality. Uh, this is an image by um, Caroline Schofield who did a project with us last year in the Crafts Council about um, making things with digital fabrication for the first time. And this is a piece that she did using exactly the same technique of hand drawing and then tracing. And this is laser cut in leather. So it's based on um, these sort of pieces that she was making out of thread. So you see it's a very different effect, but there's still her hand in it, if you know what I mean. You'll see paper cuts like this that look hand drawn, and it's because they usually are. And the really nice thing about this sort of work is that you can get a really high level of complexity, the things that would just be unfeasible to cut by hand. I mean, you could do it, but can you imagine having to like charge a price for that as a product? I mean, the million, bajillion euro, I don't know how long that would take. But uh, when you start using this equipment, you can still have like very tight control over it, very hand-drawn elements, but still be able to produce something economically. And the nice thing about the files is that once you have it, it doesn't have to be in paper like the one you're seeing there, but it can be in acrylic, like this necklace or you can start cutting into wood, or you can make something like this. This is a scarf that's laser cut out of leather that's based on a hand-drawn kind of sketch. And this one is also laser cut out of leather as well, but from a hand-drawn thing. Or you can make things like uh, out of wood, like these um, um, bookmarks. That's, that's like a really nice start, and it's a really quick way to start like producing things. But the really special things, I think, happen when you start to get to grips with the programs. And they're really not that difficult. They just have a little bit of a learning curve. And then you can start using them for what they're really great at, which is precision. Precision and control. The amount of fine grain you control you can have. This is laser cut out of sheets of paper that have been stacked on top of each other. And it's, it's really actually very small 
It's very fine grain work. This one too, it's like, I mean, you could sit down and draw this all out and cut it with a scalpel, but you'd go mad. <laughs> this one is quite a nice piece. It's cut out of aluminium um, and you wrap it around a lampshade or around a light bulb by hand to make a lampshade. Um, this sort of work, you'll often see it being used by architects or people with an architectural background because they have the experience with CAD and kind of have a head start. So this is a piece I think is particularly nice. It's um, literally paper thin sections through a building that have been cut onto individual pages and then bound into a book so you can flick through them. And you can start to like build three dimensional objects from what are very simple two dimensional files. So you can start working into like furniture that you've made from sheets of plywood or you can start bringing back that hand drawn element but also with the precision elements or you can start layering things like this to get really interesting effects. And really, it's like a good rule of thumb with the laser cutters is if it burns, you can cut it. So this is a nori for sushi, and I think that's, I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> I've also seen um, laser engraved bananas, which are pretty nice. <laughs> but you can start getting really, really complex um, surface treatments onto materials and work them back into things that are otherwise fairly handmade. But you wouldn't be able to buy that material off the shelf. I mean, if you want that level of like bespoke control over your things, then really this, this, um, these techniques are incredibly helpful for that. This looks incredibly complicated, but actually isn't that difficult to generate. So this is uh, a big paper cut that says paper planes. And it was run through a laser cutter that cut out all of these individual shapes. I can't say for absolute 100% certain, but I think it was made by a, by a really easy to use program called um, 123D Make that's free and comes from Autodesk. So with that, you put in um, a 3D model and something like that isn't that difficult to make in 3D modeling. And then it generates these templates for you to assemble. And last year, one of our craftspeople was a milliner called Martelin. And she, she made this, and sorry, this is a really dreadful photo of it, but trust me, it works exactly the same as the paper planes thing you've just seen with the intersecting things. So this is um, a piece she made out of laser cut acrylic. And there's lots of interesting tools. I just, I just really want to emphasize that it's very accessible to get into this stuff. You do not have to be a magical expert at CAD. There's lots of interesting tools like that 123D Make one I just mentioned, or this is a program that generates a dress from a quick sketch like this in flat, or flat triangular planes. And you just watch for a second there. It's like, it's just literally drawing like you would like paint, just with a mouse. And it generates this dress over on the right hand side. And then you can get those pieces laser cut and assemble them by hand in a more traditional way and end up with pieces like this. Then if you get like really into this, if you like really, really get into the digital stuff, maybe you'll start like exploring more with the medium itself. The, not the, the physicality, but digital as a medium. So this is a really lovely piece that was um, generated by a computer working out how bubbles would interact with each other. And then 3D printing the vertices along it to make this necklace. Uh, this is a scan of a sin silver candelabra where the reflections off of it were made uh, physical and then printed as a new object. This one is an overlay of two completely different tables and I like it because it's like there's the ghost of one inside the other. And this was made on a CNC machine but um, I, don't, I can't imagine how difficult that would be to make by hand to have that level of precision. But maybe you don't want to go entirely wholeheartedly into making your work digitally. What what it's also very useful for is, um, is taking some of the drudge work out of things that still have a lot of handmade elements. So uh, I like to cross stitch, so this isn't mine, but I've made things like this before. Um, but it, like sitting there and <coughs> drilling out these tiny holes over and over again with a Dremel, and if you mess up one, the whole thing's ruined and you have to start again, it's a pain. And this would take about, I don't know, probably a minute to cut out on a laser cutter. And then you can like quite quickly start putting things through. Uh, or something like this still is very much hand assembled and the thread is put in place, but the, the wooden part is cut out on a laser. Uh, Martha Lynn again, it's like, I'm going to keep talking about it. 
these are some hats she made um, last year as well that used a laser cutter. So these these elements are, oh, my mouse is gone. Anyway, um, these, these polka dots and this hand's tooth pattern weren't something that she could get off the, the shelf. And again, were something that was just too laborious to cut out by hand, it wasn't economical, so she cut it in a laser. But the, hand, the hats are otherwise completely handmade. They just have these particular trimming elements in them. Uh, Orla Kyle has been using it recently as well. It's like these, uh, the, the perforated holes are laser cut on an object that's otherwise very handmade. And uh, this was a piece that Chris Hetzel um, from Rudolf Hetzel uh, made last year with a process called electro discharge machining, which sounds scary, but it's just a, a way of cutting through metal very precisely. So these parts on the end here were all cut out by a machine in a big stack in one go because it was just too laborious to cut out them all at the same time. But it just took, it was a five minute job to cut them out in all one go. And then they were engraved afterwards. And um, you can, I like when there's a combination of handmade things and digitally made things. So on this piece, the, the brass element is water jet cut. Um, by the way, you'll notice I'm like mentioning things like EDM and CNC and laser cutting and water jet. It's all exactly the same file type. If you can use one, you can use them all. It's like if you can generate the file, you can scale up, scale down, change materials, change machines. It's just the key is to get those files in place. But anyway, this one was a um, water jet cut and then the glass element was blown through it. So I always think it's a nice combination when you have those, those really precise elements, but also the very handmade. Um, these are some uh, paper models I made for a uh, photo shoot a couple of years ago. So I have a machine called a plotter cutter, which is kind of like my junior first laser cutter. It works on the same principle, but it uses a tiny scalpel instead of a laser to cut through. So they're usually used for cutting out vinyl signage. But I drew these files up on Illustrator and um, they really weren't that difficult. And then I used the machine to cut out the particular parts and then assembled them by hand. So some little books there as well. But um, Andres Calderon has done the same thing, but on a far nicer level. Um, these, these pieces are really, really complex paper cuts, but they were cut out on a laser cutter and then hand assembled like this. But I don't know if any of you have tried to cut through that sort of heavy cardboard stock ever. It's really, really difficult. Architects in the room will be aware of the difficulty. And then when you get into like quite complex things, this is a paper model as well. And um, it's, it was generated by a program called Pepacura, which is a free one you can use. I know I'm throwing a lot of things around here. I think it's being recorded so you can all go back and take notes afterwards. But how Pepacura works is you put in a um, 3D model into it and then it generates a flat template for you like this. I mean, it's usually used for, for paper crafting, but there's no reason that that couldn't be in any other sheet material that you can assemble and have a hinge on. Even if you don't want any of this digital stuff to touch your work at all, it's still incredibly useful for, for branding, for those extra elements, for giving your, your work that extra bit of shelf presence. Um, having these, these sort of things like produced at scale can be quite expensive if you have to have like dyes made up and have to have them cut and through packaging companies. But if you're doing a small run of something and you want it to be really special, this sort of thing is really, really good for that. Or even if you just want to put those tiny finishing touches on something and have it be really professional and really personal to you. I mean, I doubt there's any maker in the room that hasn't used an off-the-shelf component or an off-the-shelf material. You're already using manufactured components in your work. But with these technologies, you can, you can make them more bespoke, more personal to you, and have a finer grade control over them. This is a particularly nice thing that was done on a laser cutter where an image was etched. So laser cutters can do three things. They can cut all the way through a material, they can score a line into it, or they can burn a series of little dots to burn away material uh, much like, um, like a printer would, except burning in. So this was a piece that where it's burned into the woodblock and then it's used to make um, otherwise very traditional woodblock prints. I think they're quite nice. And even if you don't want it on your packaging and you don't want it on your work, you can use it to make tools. Um, so this is a golden mean calipers. So when you open it up, it always sets to the golden mean ratio. 
So if you ever need any very bespoke or very particular tools that are completely unique to your practice, this is a good way to go about it. It's also very good for testing things, for prototyping it up. So this is just a, a paper prototype of what was the, the band around her, her wrist there in the end. Or this is a tiny little laser cut model of uh, what was eventually a CNC table. But you can see it's incredibly faithful. And then there's, um, there's this, which is a very complex chair that was cut out of sheet cardboard and then assembled because the machining on it was going to be really expensive. So you want to make sure it looks right before you do it. So that's laser cutting. I will answer any questions that you have about this. I know this is just a sort of a very quick whistle stop tour of like things you can do. So I'm going to have a little, just a really quick mention of 3D printing. Laser cutting and CNC is really accessible. It's really, really easy to start on. There is a steeper learning curve to things like 3D printing. And it's really only worth your while to 3D print something if it's really complicated. I mean, really complex. So complex that it'd be incredibly difficult to make any other way. If it's using minimal material, because it takes a very long time to print them. If it's small or really worth the money to make as a one-off, uh, then sure, go for it, 3D printing. Otherwise, maybe look at some other technologies. But there are a few things that are like, it's really good for. Um, you can get that sort of incredible complexity with it that's incredibly hard to make any other way. So this is um, printed out in the same material as the model over there that you might have seen when you're coming in. So it's a, a PLA plastic. And you can also print in precious materials like gold. Um, Though, depending on the printer, you may have to do a lot of hand finishing afterwards. And it's also kind of hard to find these. Uh, this is stainless steel, it's a prosthetic leg. And for things like this, it's pretty, pretty worth it because it's, it's very bespoke, personal to the, the individual user. And um, that has a high level of complexity. So printing something like this is a good idea. Uh, this is platinum, um, so you can get it done in that as well. What this sort of 3D printing stuff is good for in cases of these very expensive precious materials is if you don't want to lose a lot of material in machining something out. So I could like make this with a CNC machine out of a block of platinum, but the amount of material I would lose would mean that it was just madness, sheer uneconomic madness. Uh, ceramics are also something that's being investigated a lot with 3D printing. So it works a little bit like um, like a very complicated computer controlled coil pot. So it sort of extrudes it out like icing and builds it up. Sometimes they're hand finished because they can be quite rigid. But you can get incredibly complex things that just are not feasible to make any other way. So there's a lot of potential for things like that. Um, you can scan things and print out uh, replicas of them. So this is printed out of a material that's very like um, gypsum. But when it's sticking it together with a sort of a binding agent, it also injects uh, ink into it. So that's how you can get this full color resolution. Um, this one is plastic again, but it has like a lovely lightness and complexity about it. You can also use it for casting. And this is where it, it can actually be very, very good. So you can get printers that will print in, um, in wax and make you a positive for a mold. So if you're doing something that's pretty difficult to make and you want to do it quickly and you want to use that mold again and again, then it actually does make sense to 3D print it. Uh, you can do it in paper. This is one of those uh, full color prints being hacked out of a block of paper there. But there are problems with it as well. If you look closely at many of the 3D printed things around today, you'll always get this striation um, along the surface of anything 3D printed. And that's because there's lots of different types of 3D printers and we can talk about them uh, in questions afterwards if you have specific queries, but they all work on the same basic principle, which is building up layer by layer of material on top of each other to make a solid object. So because they're building up those layers, there's also going to be a certain resolution problem. So what you're seeing here on these lines is the actual layer. So that's a layer and that's a layer. And sometimes you will get that ridginess to it. It depends on the printer, but you'll pay for quality. So while the sort of things we have here today could be quite cheap to get done, if you're getting, like if you really need that high, high, high quality, you're gonna pay 
a factor more for it. But if you do get into 3D printing, there are incredible things you could do with it. Uh, this is a dress that's being worn by Dita von Tees. And you can see how the, the mesh changes size as it goes up her body. It's not stretchy. It's just that they took a scan of her body and then printed this in uh, a rigid but hinged material. So it would exactly and precisely fit her body and her body alone. You can see things like this. This is a, a 3D printed fabric that, well, sort of fabric. It's kind of like a chain mail almost. But this was printed in one block unit. These aren't like little pieces that have to be assembled. It was just made wholesale in one. And then um, Pringle have been integrating them into to pieces of clothing like this to kind of interesting effect. That's in there again. Um, if, you, if you don't know how to 3D model, there's only so much you're going to get out of 3D printing. It, it really is the, the big blockage to it. You can scan things like you would the drawing, but I mean, it's the creative equivalent of photocopying. So you, you don't have a lot of control over things. And also, how good your print is depends on how good your scan is. Scan is and there's a lot of limiting factors like that. But if you would like to get started on it and try some small things, there are places like this, this Thingiverse which is a website that has thousands and thousands and thousands of ready-to-print 3D models that you can download for free. So if there's a particular element or something that you just want to try, it's like, this is a good place to start with it. If you want to learn how to 3D model, um, these are really good places to start. SketchUp, um, Tinkercad and Sculptress are all free. So SketchUp is, is quite good for kind of blocky kind of things. Uh, Tinkercad can be a little bit more refined, and Sculptress uh, is like having a digital block of clay that you, you mould and press, but is not very good for really fine grain control on, um, on dimensions or anything like that. So we will be running um, a course, we'll talk about it in a little while, but we'll be running a course um, about laser cutting and, and making these with digital fabrication. You've seen it on your, your leaflets there. But just in case any of you here today would like to go forward with these things and uh, won't be part of that, I just want to show you a little video from a woman called Fiona Snow, who runs a, a cutting service in Dublin, just so you can see how easy it is to interact with these and how cheap it can be to get these things made up. Hi, I'm Fiona Snow. I run Snow, uh, we're a design and laser cutting company in the city centre in Dublin. And um, yeah, you're welcome to the studio. We uh, offer a laser cutting service as well as making our own laser, uh, laser cut products uh, for sale. So we have uh, from the simplest, like a simple just cut service, get, you send us a file, we cut something out, we post it back to you, to a more complex sort of bespoke uh, laser cutting service where you'd have an uh, entire design and file generation completed by us in consultation with, with our client. Um, so it ranges a lot in between those. We have a Zing uh, 40 watt laser cutter. So that's made by Epilog, who are an American company and make very high standard lasers. Um, it has a cutting bed of 600 by 300 mil, which is quite small on the scale of things for lasers. But for the sort of work we do and the sort of materials we cut, it, it's perfect. The main materials we work in are wood, paper, and plastics. Um, and with plastics, it's nearly exclusively acrylic, so sheet acrylic sheet, like Perspex or Plexiglass. Um, we generally work up to a maximum material thickness of four mil. We can push it a bit to five or six mil, but the power of our laser isn't best suited to that. I'm happiest running the laser on, on thin materials, on papers and cards, which is where my own work really centers itself. And we do a lot of stuff then as well in birch plywood, which is a really nice, just plywood sheet. As a rule of thumb, I generally say, um, based on the thickness of the material, you shouldn't really go less than half the thickness of the material in terms of the width of your cut. So if you have a four mil material, the finest you could go would be roughly two mil. Now, when we get down into papers, that obviously gives us a lot of flexibility because if we're working with a 0.3 mil paper, we can cut down, not quite, but nearly to about 0.2 mil, something like that. So there's a huge variation. And it depends on what you're cutting as well and what you're working with. If it's for mass production, you don't want to hold it a point two mil lines in there. If it's a one-off, you know, high quality, expensive piece, maybe you do. Um, so it, it does depend, it's, it's a bit of a movable feast. Um, and again, with plastics, you're getting a bit of melt, so you need to allow for that as well. So. 
The best way is to send us an email. Um, our website is snow.ie and you can contact us through there. And then you'll probably get in touch with Mike, with my husband, who runs that side of things. Um, and if you can be as specific as possible at the beginning, and I know for some people that can be quite difficult because you don't know what you want to do. But if you can try and think about um, the material you're thinking of cutting, is it paper, wood or plastic, the sort of size you're doing, can we do it? Like our, our bed size is fairly small um, on the grand scheme of things. And then take a read through as well on the on the um, on our website. We have a, a a guide there for what your files should look like. Are you able to provide the files, or do we need to provide the files? So try and and send us an email that has just a nice little overview of what you want. We have information on the site, and we have no problem being contacted if you need more information. We can help you from there. The best file that you can send us is an AI, an Illustrator file. Brilliant, perfect. Laser runs out of Illustrator, so we don't need to do anything to it, apart from change some line weights and colors. Um, if you don't have any Illustrator skills, uh, CAD files are, are brilliant as well. We can work very happily with DWGs or DXFs, no problem. Um, a PDF is great, so if you're doing um, if you're doing something like Corel Draw or something like that, you can send us a PDF or an EPS. Um, so any vector-based file is brilliant. Um, don't, unless it's a very specific application, we probably won't be able to use a JPEG or anything like that. We need vectors, we need cutting paths for the machine. Yeah. It's kind of how long it's a piece of string with something like that. We have a minimum charge for an initial uh, job fee of 40 euro plus VAT. Um, so that would cover a lot for, for a lot of people if they're just getting something small done, they'd be able to get it for that kind of thing. Um, and then in order for to get a specific price, obviously you need to know what material you're cutting and how much cutting and engraving is involved. There are two different processes that the laser can achieve. So it depends on what you're doing. But I, as an example here, we have little lanyards. Um, these We never really sold these. These were little uh, for the Maker Faire in, in down Science Gallery, we did these. Um, so these ones are in wood. So it'd be slightly cheaper in wood than in acrylic. So you can see one there in red and acrylic. So with something like that, you're probably looking around 450 per unit. Something like this, probably more like 520 per unit. Depends on what you're going for um, and the amount of detail on the surface. I think my favorite project, um, it, it's one of those interesting things where you do something uh, sort of on a whim and then it morphs into something else and goes from there. And I have it here, let me just reach over and get it for you. Um, I was asked by, the guys down at 3FE, the coffee place, they needed a trophy for one of the coffee awards that they were doing. You know, they, they liked what I did and they asked me would I make an object. And I had been messing around with the idea for this for months. I've been playing around in my head with paper uh, and triangles and pattern and how to work them together. So as soon as they asked me to do this, I thought, brilliant, this is my this is my chance, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna have, you know, take this as an opportunity to expand on that. This slowly morphed into a lamp. Uh, we did sort of a, a standard um, a standard lamp, like a that you put on your, on your cable or on your sideboard. Um, and that slowly then morphed into a project I did with the National Museum over in Collins Barracks. And they commissioned a pendant light. So a much larger version of this, it's probably about that size. Um, and that has gone into the museum and we'll put up this Christmas. You know, stuff like that really grows. Um, and that's what's brilliant about machines like this, the ability to manufacture in-house and actually do stuff like that and respond quickly to design challenges is fantastic. So seriously, if you're anywhere near Dublin and you need laser cutting done, go to Fiona, she's so nice. She's so nice. But uh, here's a really scary looking chart. Um, it's not if you go through it. But if any of you, like after today, want to, to try out some of these machines or want to like try making some things, you'll find this, I'll show you the address in a minute, which is kind of like a handy flow chart to figure out what sort of file types you need to make and what sort of materials work well with which um, uh, which machinery. So you'll find that on the Craft Council website just here. Um, I'm sure Claire will all send you the, the address if you want it.